Hello and welcome to Global Healthcast, brought to you by Global Health Press. Once a week, we bring to you news and news about vaccines and vaccination. I am Joe Schmidt, and with me is Dr. Melvin Senegas. Good evening, Melvin. I wish you all the best to Switzerland. Good evening, Professor Schmidt. Um, good evening as well, and good morning or good afternoon to all of us, all of those who are um, watching or listening to us. Winter has come to Switzerland and also to Germany. As you can see, we're sitting here with uh, heavy coats, heavy coating, right? But uh, still, we wanted to bring you the news for this week. And Melvin will talk about new route for COVID-19 infection of human cells. Adherence to dietary pattern may, you know, increase your life expectancy. We have a commentary from Singapore on dengue vaccine. And uh, Melvin found a nice piece on anthrax, which uh, is a problem in Uganda. And I will briefly cover a new chikungunya live vaccine licensed by the FDA. Melvin, what's the new receptor for the COVID virus? Yes, so um, scientists have known for more than three years now that the main entry point for SARS-CoV-2 into the body is the ACE2 receptor. Um, however, a team in Italy um, has now identified another receptor called RAGE or RAGE, and this is present on the surface of certain human immune cells, which can bind to SARS-CoV-2 and allow it to enter cells, altering their function and leading to a worse prognosis. Um, the research is a collaboration between uh, a group at the University of Padova and researchers from the Human Technopole Group at the University um, of Milan. So this molecular pathway emerge had not been associated before um, to a viral infection, and the activation of the RAGE receptor in monocytes, um, a type of white blood cells, was really correlated with a worse COVID-19 prognosis. And we, we have heard about this receptor already in the past for severe inflammatory outcomes in diabetes and uh, obesity, but this has never been observed in the context of viral infection. So this is a very interesting uh, study that came out of uh, this group in Italy. Very interesting indeed. And now the, the disease has been with us for some years. And it is amazing that still very important new findings come along, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, very interesting, yeah? The Nature paper. Yes. You have, uh, actually you're interested, I see this from our last Global Healthcast 52, that you're interested in diets, right? So this time you want to prolong your life. And how do you do that, Melvin? Yes, so previously we talked about uh, reducing salt intake, right, which would really um, significantly help you with your control of your blood pressure. And so this one is sort of similar, but um, this is really a study showing us that if people with unhealthy or the typical dietary patterns in the UK, because this was done in the UK, were to follow the Eat Well Guide recommendations, um, they would be able to um, reduce their risk of getting um, the non-communicable diseases and basically increase their life expectancy. And this is using a prospective population-based cohort data from the UK Biobank. The researchers show that sustained dietary change from unhealthy patterns to the Eat Well Guide um, dietary rec recommendation is associated with an 8.9 and 8.6 years gain in life expectancy for 40-year-old males and females, respectively. And in the same population, sustained dietary change from unhealthy to, to longevity-associated dietary patterns is associated with 10.8 and 10.4 years gain in life expectancy in males and females, respectively. And basically, the bottom line is that if you eat healthy, you can increase your life expectancy by at least 10 years. So... What you need is grains, nuts, fruits, and less sugar, sweetened beverages, and processed meats, okay? Yes. Very good. Yep. I can remember this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very interesting, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess it shouldn't be too difficult, specifically as they don't mention any wine here. So uh, I guess, you know, whole grains and nuts and fruits is no problem for me, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. 
Here, what is the commentary on dengue in uh, in Singapore? I just returned from dengue, and they tell me they have less mosquitoes than ever. Yes, yeah, so um, this is a commentary by two of the top infectious disease experts in Singapore. And basically, they're trying to say that almost every year, um, there is a fresh warning about dengue outbreaks uh, in Singapore. Um, and this is even though the, the government has been doing everything they can to really reduce uh, the number of mosquitoes uh, by really mosquito control methods, right? And um, But even if they have been doing that for several years now, even before the pandemic and during the pandemic, the number of cases of dengue and the dengue outbreaks don't really disappear. Um, and, and so what they're trying to say is that mosquito control methods are good, but it seems to be telling us that it's not enough, that really we have two vaccines now um, approved in, in many countries. Um, and even though they're not perfect, these vaccines could help control the dengue outbreaks in Singapore. So the indication or the call for a vaccine is to reduce the number of cases and to control the disease, not to eliminate the disease, correct? Yes. That's right. Okay. And uh, the one vaccine can only be used in seropositive individuals. Uh, do they have any preference? Do they, do they uh, make any claims what they think should be no, done they, or is they, it more they general? They mentioned all the different vaccines. Basically, they mentioned the first vaccine, Dengvaxia, that needs to have a test or you need to confirm that you have been infected in the past. They also mentioned Qdenga, the vaccine that does not need uh, a test to be used. And they also mentioned the third vaccine that's coming, um, which is not yet approved anywhere, but the, it's, it's also a good review of all the vaccines that are um, available and in the pipeline. Very nice. Thank you for this piece. And finally, you have something on, an, um, let, let me say, uh, um, disease that receives very little attention, but that seems to be important. Yes, so uh, this is, um, this is news from Uganda. They have confirmed 17 deaths from anthrax last weekend. Um, it was basically the source of a mysterious outbreak. Um, and anthrax is a serious infectious disease caused by gram-positive uh, bacteria known as Bacillus anthracis. It usually occurs naturally in soil and commonly affects domestic and wild animals around the world. And people can get sick with ant anthrax if they come in contact with infected animals or contaminated animal products. Um, and it can cause severe illness in both humans and animals. So I, I think this is something that um, is important for global health, especially in countries where cases of anthrax uh, happen uh, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And here you have the life cycle again. Yes. So just for people to understand how people can get infected with anthrax. So uh, as I've mentioned, uh, you can you can get it from animals, but the, the anthrax spores can get inside the body and they can be activated and um, the bacteria can multiply, spread out in the body, produce toxins and cause severe illness. And this can happen when people breathe in the spores of the anthrax or eat food or drink water contaminated with spores or get spores in a cut or a scrape in the skin. And it is very uncommon for people uh, in, let's say, in Europe or in the United States to get infected with anthrax. But in some countries in Africa, it is actually um, quite common. It can happen. Um, animals can also get infected with anthrax. So domestic and wild animals can become infected when they breathe in or ingest spores in contaminated soil, plants, or water. And the animals can include cattle, sheep, goats, antelope, deers. And in areas where domestic animals have had anthrax in the past, routine vaccination can help prevent outbreaks. Okay, very interesting. I remember uh, Bacillus anthracis as a potential bi um, bioterrorist weapon, um, but I, I didn't follow up that story. So it is interesting that it recently caused death in uh, in a country even 17 deaths that's interesting yeah? yeah that's a significant number of deaths i would say yeah yeah very good i only have one story today and that is about chikungunya and i want to start with repeating what melvin told you in a previous global health cast which is that chikungunya is a severe debilitating disease 
with fever, joint pain, rash, headache, muscle pain. And some of these cases are even prolonged and they may last for months to years. And chikungunya, the word, means that people go bent over because of the pain that they suffer from. And again, it is really, really a severe infection. Now, uh, I don't want to go into details. This infection is spreading and we also covered this. Uh, this is one of the important diseases for which WHO wants to have a vaccine as soon as possible. And you see the dots, the little dots are where we have disease cases today and it already reached Europe. It is present in North America, in South America, in Africa, and in Asia, in the uh, uh, zones that are indicated here. Now, the vector is needed for that, mosquitoes of the Aedes species, and you see that it is expected that these vectors will spread. And very likely, in many of the areas where we don't have the little dots, where we have no cases yet, in the future, there will be cases. To date, uh, people give the number of 5 million cases in the past 15 years. Uh, I'm not sure this is probably a very conservative estimate. We don't know the real number, but uh, it is a severe disease and 5 million is really a very big number, even if you consider this as case numbers around the globe. Why I bring this up? There are now four vaccine candidates out there. There is a life attenuated vaccine, a virus like particle with an adjuvant, a vector based vaccine and an inactivated virus plus adjuvant vaccine. And I bring this all up today because the first vaccine has been licensed on November 9, 2023 by FDA. So very, very good news. And what I would like to do with you, and maybe we do this sometimes in the future a little bit more often, I want to tell you about the product profile that you can find in the FDA uh, package insert. So what is this vaccine about? The product is uh, named Xchik and it's produced by Verniva. It is a life attenuated chikungunya virus vaccine based on a certain strain. It probably cross neutralizes to the other strains. It is indicated for adults of 18 years and older who are at increased risk of chikungunya virus exposure. So it is not a routine vaccine for everybody around the globe or in an endemic area, but only if you're an adult and you have an increased risk for exposure. It is a light vaccine to be given in one dose intramuscularly. Contraindications are allergy, as with any vaccine, and pregnancy. Pregnancy is very important because, <coughs> excuse me, the natural disease, the wild virus, causes viremia, and that may go to the unborn, and the newborn then may even die from chikungunya. It's it's a severe disease in the uh, in the baby once it is born. It is also contraindicated as a live vaccine in immunocompromised host. So there are relevant contraindications. There is no efficacy study because this is not feasible to be done, but there is a serological study based on neutralization test, and there the zero response rate for the, the dose to be given was 98.9% at day 28 after vaccination and 96.3% six months later. So this is a, a pretty good vaccine. Uh, the question is, if you need a second dose, right? There is no long-term data on duration of um, protection, and uh, there's also no long-term follow-up yet. It's not possible uh, to have a long-term follow-up. Uh, how these neutralization titers um, will wane with time if they persist. Usually, live vaccines give you lifelong protection, let's say yellow fever vaccine, or you need two doses for lifelong protection like measles, mumps, rubella, varicella. Co-administration, there is no data. The reactionicity of the vaccine is quite high. I refer to the package insert for that. And just to remind you, there may be chikungunya-like disease due to the viremia in the first days after vaccination through day 14. So you get, like with a measles vaccine, sometimes you get a little bit of a fever and maybe a rash, but with chikungunya, you may even get a chikungunya-like disease. 
And this is what is listed under the safety uh, and warnings. It is, there may be severe or prolonged chikungunya-like disease preventing daily activities, requiring medical intervention, and this in 1.6% of vaccinees. Rarely, there were cases of hypovolemic hyponatremia, atrial fibrillation, and again, more than 30 days or prolonged chikungunya-like disease was occurred in some patients. Again, viremia I mentioned, leukopenia and syncope are other uh, possible side effects of this vaccine. Summing it all up, it is not a perfect vaccine, but it is a first step. And very clearly, the goal of this vaccine is individual protection for those with high risk of exposure to chikungunya. Given the safety profile of this live vaccine, I think this is nothing for mass vaccination. If 1.6% of the vaccinees will need medical attention, this is something that uh, is difficult to accomplish. But uh, individual protection for people traveling to endemic areas or to an outbreak area at a given point, uh, th this may be a very good um, vaccine for protection. Melvin, any questions to Ixchik? No, I, I think it's good, Professor, that you mentioned about the special warnings because people should should know, um, especially if they're planning to take the vaccine, that yes, it has a very good immunogenicity, but in terms of looking at the risk benefit for the vaccine, they should know what they're taking, right? Yeah. And just to mention, uh, again, this is an extremely debilitating disease. And uh, I guess this is why this product received accelerated approval. It had fast track and breakthrough designation by the FDA and received a priority review. So there is a huge unmet medical need. And uh, again, this is the first vaccine to be out. And let's see what the other vaccine candidates will come up with. And we will keep you posted on this one. Let us know how you like our product profiles for different vaccines summarized all together in one slide. We would love to hear your comments. Melvin, this was it. We spoke about a new route for the COVID-19 virus to enter human cells. Uh, um, Melvin spoke about healthy diet dietary patterns, how they can increase your life expectancy by up to 10 years. We heard a commentary from Singapore on dengue prevention by vaccination. We heard about the anthrax outbreak in Uganda and finally about the first chikungunya vaccine licensed by FDA with the name of Ixchik. And Melvin, you have a cartoon here. Yes, so um, we have shown something similar in the past, but I think it's just good to remind people that our own experiences is rarely the whole truth. So it's just looking at all these blind people um, touching an elephant, right? They're seeing a snake, a wall, or a rope, but we just have to bear in mind that um, it's good to be open-minded when we are um, exposed to new information. So I think that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and this is all science, right? What the result and your conclusion are based on when you look where and what methods you're using. Very interesting slide. Thank you very much. That was Global Healthcast 53. Thank you for joining us. I wish you a wonderful week. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone, for watching us and listening. Be safe. Get your vaccines if you haven't yet.